Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Morning, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah. Always a critic. All right. (laughs) Okay, is that better, sir? Okay, I'm just... Anyway, uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for being here, and it's uh, wonderful to participate in this with my friends Marty and Danny, and thanks, uh, Tab, for putting this together. And uh, they assigned three of us this topic because they figure we'll have to circle it, and maybe between the three of us we'll be able to make some sense of it. Uh, you know, emotional sobriety, when you hear that, uh, you know, what is, this all comes from an article that Bill Wilson wrote in the Grapevine in January of 1958, Emotional Sobriety. The final frontier, and uh, ever since then, that we all decided that it was maybe advanced AA, or uh, well, gosh, I'm sober now. I guess I should get some of that emotional sobriety. And uh, I've always thought if they just changed the word sobriety to maturity, uh, it would suddenly make a lot more sense to all of us. And uh, my wife sent me a text right before this started and said, "Well, oh, please have fun today." And I said, "Oh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm about to do a workshop with the other speakers on a." Emotional sobriety, so I will be lying, and uh, which, uh, you know, and I'll just give you a snapshot of who I am. My sobriety date is September 16, 1991. That puts me at the 30-year mark. Thursday, I caught a red eye to fly out of here from Bellingham, Washington, and it literally just about when I had my hand on the suitcase going out the door, I got in a dust-up with my wife, made it about a half an hour down the road, had to get on the phone with her, make my amends, clean that up, and I'm thinking, doing pretty good for 30 years. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know how the normal people do it. I don't know how they live without the tools. I, I don't. Uh, you know, I have very strong emotions. You couple that with the fact I really enjoy thinking. And I don't know if anybody identifies with that. but And here's the problem with really, I must like it. I do it all the time. Uh, and I don't know about you, but my thoughts in the warm, safe confines of my mind always strike me as, I don't know, magnificent. Don't you? <laughs> don't yours, you know? It seems that only when you add volume and oxygen and say it out loud to a sponsor do you hear the idiocy of your thoughts. And, <laughs> and I, got, I got some problems I'm going to have to overcome when I get sober if I'm ever going to scratch the surface of this emotional sobriety or emotional maturity. And that's because, like many of us, by the time I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been brainwashed. Maybe you were brainwashed too. And uh, we were all brainwashed, many of us, by the same group of people. These are non-alcoholics that love us. They're family members, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, children, employers, community leaders, district attorneys, <laughs> doctors that stitch us up and we don't feel the needle and that surprises them. And they, and they say things to us, don't they? Like, you're a great guy. You have a lot of potential. You could probably be anything you wanted to be if you just quit drinking. Go anywhere you wanted to go if you just quit drinking. All your dreams come true if you just quit drinking. And what a guy like me does is I lay my experience against that information and what do I find? Well, I went to jail, I was drinking, smacked that guy, I was drinking, blew up the relationship, I was drinking, lost the job, I was drinking. Yeah, it's the damn whiskey. And it's easy for me to identify whiskey as the culprit. And I think, and this is a a self-delusion, a false psychotic belief I have about myself produced by this brainwashing, is all I have to do is put the plug in the jug and I'm going to be fine, and I'm really a wonderful human being, just ask me. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm quick to admit I'm a liar, a cheat, and a thief under the influence, but we all know those things are impossible in the sober state until I continue to lie, cheat, and steal sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. And we begin to suspect, at least a guy like me does, that perhaps this thing called sobriety is a lot more than just drinking or not drinking. And what are we going to do about a thing like that? And in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's suggested that we work the steps. And you do, you look at this curriculum, if you will, that's in the big book, and you get this big payoff at the end. You get a spiritual awakening, which seems inadequate and insufficient at first glance. 
to correct what is so deeply wrong with a guy like me because the list is endless, isn't it? I'm petty. I'm insecure. I'm quick to judgment. I'm violent. I'm rageful. I take inventory, but it's usually yours. <laughs> I'm in collision with something or somebody at all times. I'm prey to misery and depression. Anybody want to date yet? You know? <laughs> I'm selfish and self-centered to my core. I'm an egomaniac, in my sponsor's words, which isn't that I think well of myself, it's that I think only of myself. And because I only live and think in my own vessel, how would I know that that's abnormal? How would I know that normal people don't get up every morning thinking of themselves, continue to think of themselves through the day, have encounters with other human beings, wondering what they're thinking about them, and that's their normal? So I just think everybody does that. They don't. I found out. I asked. There's a lot of normal people who don't know what I'm talking about. I stopped asking. So now we're talking about this thing called emotional sobriety, and I think it could be misleading. I think that we think we have to reinvent the wheel. Like, okay, I'm physically sober. I know how to go to meetings. I know how to take commitments. I know how to do 12-step work. I sponsor other people. I pass it along. I'm doing pretty good. And what happened for a guy like me is by the time I was 15 years sober, I had developed a really, really awesome stage character. And in the big book, we talk about that. To the world, he presents, his, he presents his stage character. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but in his heart, he knows he doesn't deserve it. You start to get inklings that maybe you've got too much of a stage character going. When you're driving home from the meeting and your beautiful wife, who's a sober member, Alcoholics Anonymous Eileen, is sitting next to you, and you're maybe 10 years sober, and she goes, God, I wish you treated me at home the way you treat me at the meetings. And it doesn't shock you. And it doesn't surprise you because you instantly think, well, hell, there's witnesses there. <laughs> and you start to realize that you're living a double life. Now, the thing about it is there's not a lot going on. I'm not going to jail. I'm not crashing cars. I'm not burning down jobs. I'm not tearing down the relationship. But I am not the same guy at all times. I'm living that chameleon-like existence. I've turned AA into some type of self-help program, forgetting that AA is not a self-help program. It's a yourself sucks program. <laughs> and what I've done unconsciously, and I want to be clear about this, this was not a decision I made. You're looking at a guy that prayed and meditated every morning. And there seemed to be some type of spiritual guillotine hanging at the front door that when I went out, it severed my conscious contact. And I ran on self-will all day in collision with somebody or something. Went to a meeting at night, hopefully got called on so I could share something spiritual. <laughs> Went home and wondered why I wasn't changing on the inside. You see, I changed on the outside. That was easy. It's easy to clean up and figure out what they want to see. You learn the language around here, and you speak in that language, and you're accepted by the tribe. You learn how to work and make a living and make those financial amends, and the life springs up around you. You find out that living life on life's terms in a societal level really isn't that tough. That if I'm not, you know, drinking and doing all that other nonsense, uh, you can actually pay your bills. And uh, if you do that, they'll give you stuff. You know, it's funny. But on the inside, where my soul lives, am I free? Am I happy and joyous? Am I able to meet life on life's terms? And the answer was no. And now, as my friend Bob B. from Minnesota says, and I love this, he goes, life is, underst life is lived forward, but understood backwards. So I want to be clear. I at 15 years sober, I wasn't a mess. I didn't feel like I was a mess. I had gratitude dripping from my fingertips. My life had been incredibly transformed and resurrected. At 15, I was perfect. But I looked back at the guy at 10, and I went, well, that guy was an idiot. But at 10, I was perfect. I looked back at the guy at 5 and went, moron. <laughs> at 5, I was perfect. But I looked back at the guy at 1 and said, how did he get out of the house clothed in the morning, right? <laughs> We're perfect if we're sober and we're in the game. 
And we've taken Alcoholics Anonymous into our hearts and the minds, and we're trying. And what I'm trying to share with you is experience. And if I do nothing else, maybe I could just save somebody a little bit of time. That's all I'm trying to do. But your path is your path, and for me, it took what it took. And what I discovered, when I say I tried to turn AA into a self-help program, I mean this and nothing less. It was my job to fix me, which is interesting, because I've been a student of the big book since I got sober. So I know what it said in the third step. I know it said that selfish and self-centeredness is the root of my troubles. I have to get rid of self. I must or it kills me, and there's no way of getting rid of it entirely without God's help. We can't even reduce it much under our own power. We had to quit trying. I get it intellectually. But how am I living? Have I really surrendered? Have I really said, Dad, of myself I am nothing? I know you do the work. I can't do a damn thing about any of these things that are eating my lunch. And it's a great day, I believe, in any alcoholic's life when you hit a point of surrender, where you look in the mirror and your reflection stares back at you and you look at yourself in the eyes and you say, I am so damn tired of being you. And that seems to be the time that we can let God in, when we can come to him in a humble manner. And what happened for me is I had to re-examine the seventh step. And this is how I used to work the seventh step. Well, here's a better way to put it. (laughs) I put a lot of effort for a lot of years into fixing myself. And what I mean by that is I became very aware of what was wrong with me, which is very therapeutic if you think about it. You know, and that's what we do. You know, there's nothing wrong with therapy or outside help. Nothing. I'm a big advocate of it. But in my experience, and I have some experience there, what therapy helped me do in different forms, in marriage counseling, things like that, is help me understand why I did what I did when I did it. So the next time I did what I did when I do it, I'd know why I was doing it. (laughs) We're a little different in AA. We have a shorter program. It's called Knock It Off. (laughs) Just knock it off. What do you do when you got a head full of, I know what's wrong with me, coupled with, I know what I should be doing instead, yet you can't knock it off. You still scream and yell. You still feel victimized. You still take credit for all the good in your life and blame others when things don't go your way. These personality insecurities that you're well aware of many years in the sobriety, now, if you know what's wrong with you and you know what you, you should be doing instead, let's all agree I no longer have an information problem. I have a lack of power problem. Does that sound familiar? Over a decade into this deal, and I'm examining the first step again. Isn't that something? I'm starting to think about powerlessness in a whole different way at well over a decade sober because I had no trouble surrendering my drinking and that other stuff and admitting that I was powerless over it. But I didn't do that with my character defects. Oh, I turned in some of the stuff, the stuff you could see, the stuff that was in the way of me getting where I wanted to go in my life. But these other things, it wasn't that I was holding them back from God, and it wasn't that I cherished them. A lot of these things were horrible, causing me a lot of pain and the people around me a lot of pain. I wanted to be a better, different version of myself. But somehow I got it in my head that it was up to me to go out in the world and on a daily basis try to be a better version of me, and I don't have the power, and I didn't know it or accept it. doesn't matter. I was acting like a guy that has power. So what happens? Progress but fleeting progress, but it doesn't stick. A feeling I'm getting better only to find out I'm living with my character defects the way my alcoholism is described in chapter three. Brief periods of recovery followed always by a still worse relapse. A feeling I was regaining control to find out I had lost more control, right? And I'm doing it with my character defects. So what does that end up making a person feel like? Inadequate, frustrated, tired, you start to think, what's the point? I'm never going to change. 
And I'm glad I didn't give up the fight. And I'm glad that I had strong sponsorship in my life and strong men in my life that I was willing to talk about these problems I was having with my character defects. And not one of them steered me wrong. I think they all said some variation of the same thing. And I just couldn't seem to access it until I hit a point of surrender and humility where I was so tired of trying to change, it became apparent I wasn't ever going to do it. If it was going to happen, something big was going to have to happen in my life, and that power was going to have to come from somebody other than my ego. And now I'm ready to go to God, and I'm ready to look at the seventh step in an entirely different way. I expended a tremendous amount. I want to be clear about this. I was raised right. I know the difference between right and wrong. I'm a good human being. I've done some horrible things in my life. But underneath that, I got a good soul. I know that about myself. So it bothered me tremendously. I was not somebody that said, oh, well, what you see is what you get. I did not want to live the way I was living, act the way I was living at certain times. With that kind of humility, I now understood that all that effort, I tried so hard to change and I couldn't. Effort will have to be expended. I was expending it in the wrong direction. And I want to tell you, for the last 15 years, I have put no effort whatsoever into working on my character defects. None whatsoever. And today, I'm happier, calmer. Violence has been not a part of my life for a very long time. Anger has not been a part of my life for a very long time. I get perturbed. I get disturbed like everyone else. I don't lose my cool. It's rare. I'm quick to make amends when I'm wrong. I understand and look for the ripples I leave in the pond of life and how I affect the other guy. And it's intuitive today where I had to make it a work habit before. I have changed. A lot of these character defects have been removed or as a one day at a time program, I can bring it into my daily living, my prayer and meditation. And for that day, just today, because that's all I've got, I can live free of those things. If I choose to what? Go to this power that is the right place to bring it. All that effort, all that energy I put into working on myself to become a better version of me, I knocked it off. It's a fool's errand for a guy like me. Where's that energy now? Prayer meditation. Prove my conscious contact with God as I understand him. I have found that when I simply do as I think God would have me do, simply think as I think God would have me think, I don't even have to be right. I am just simply, that is my approach to life. I'm just trying to do what I think God would have me do. Regardless of the accuracy of that, in that moment, or moments that I'm in that state, my character defects are instantaneously removed. They cannot take a deep breath. That is my experience. Does that mean that when I don't have a good conscious contact with God, everything, all hell breaks loose? No, of course not. It just means that somebody slips you know, the leash off the tiger. That's all. It means it's possible. So what's the answer for a guy like me? You didn't hide it from me, did you? Conscious contact. I'm awake, I'm conscious. Try to be connected to that power. How, when? As often as possible for a guy like you, Don as often as possible. I have found there's no middle road for me. I'm a guy that's either going to have an outstanding, spectacular, bright, shiny, vibrant relationship with this power, or I'm going to live with my ego. There is no in-between for me. Thanks for listening. I'll pass it to Marty. Thanks, Don. Good morning, y'all. My name is Marty Ruby. I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had to take a drink since October the 19th of 1989, and I'm as grateful as I know how to be about that right there. And so emotional sobriety. I always like to think of emotional sobriety. Uh, what It sounds it's it's this broad concept, but when I start to think of it as emotional drunkenness, I get that. I know how to be an emotional drunk. In fact, I did it just the other day. You know, I was... I, <clears throat> I did something stupid, and I went to Home Depot with my husband. (laughs) And so we were, you know, I started gardening this year, first year to ever garden. So you know that means 
I'm plowing under an acre. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to feed the world. It's not just a couple of plants. No, right? <laughs> Got to go way over the top because that's how I roll. I know none of y'all do. But then, uh, so, but, but the first thing I put my plants in, my dog runs right through it. So I'm like, <clears throat> I need a fence. Okay. Now my husband is a rancher. He can build and fix and do anything you can think of. So we go to the, we go to the Home Depot. And I'm like, this is the fence I want. I want the cute one, <laughs> right? I want the cute one. It's not very practical, but it's adorable, right? And he goes, well, now, darling, that's not going to work. And I went, what do you mean it's not going to work? He's like, this one over here is going to be much better. Well, now, remember, he's only been ranching his whole life. I've been gardening for about 15 minutes. <laughs> and he's not... He's not yielding to my influence, dad gummit. And so I literally went, okay, fine. Get whatever you want, right? And I actually stopped my feet <laughs> down the aisle of Home Depot. Yes, I did. Oh, yes, I did. Right? We got the fence he wanted. All right. So this, I say this because it didn't take me to the end of the aisle, to Don's point, that I knew perhaps I'd cross the line, <laughs> right? Perhaps I'd cross the line into that emotional drunkenness. One more time. One more time. Uh, I really think about in terms of spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. I got to aim for spiritual perfection. Right? I'd love to be able to go to Home Depot with my husband and have it be a pleasant experience. Haven't had that yet. Um, <laughs> but I'm aiming for it. I am aiming for it, and I'm confident with God's help I'm going to be able to do it one of these days. Um, so I just want to give you a little background about <clears throat> who your spiritual speaker will be tomorrow morning. Um, uh, and really, you know, to Don's point, also, this is about maturity, and I was thinking about how alcohol was just a symptom of my underlying spiritual condition. I want what I want when I want it. And I will come through you, over you, to get it, right? And, uh, and, and I will resort to whatever means necessary. If it involves stomping my feet, I'll do it. If it you know, uh, uh, and that's what I am without God's help. Absolutely. Um, I remember one morning uh, I was getting ready for work, <clears throat> and I'm a little cranky in the morning. You know, I have very low blood pressure. I'm going to live forever, according to my doctor, but it's really hard to get me going in the morning. So I'm a little cranky, and I'm complaining about my boss. Shocking. Complaining about my boss. And my husband says to me one morning, well, darling, you know what's interesting? Because he's a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, too, and he says, You've hated every boss you've ever had. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, of course I have. I'm emotionally immature. And I'm and and I and and Bill Wilson talks about the fact that I'm dependent, emotionally dependent on other people or circumstances for my prestige, my security, you know, my peace of mind. And here's the thing. My experience has shown me, taught me, experienced me, that that never works. It never works. It leaves me feeling neurotic and insecure and, and depressed and uninspired. Imagine. <laughs> so here I am, realizing in that, you know, when he points that out to me, I get to talk to my sponsor about that, who says, my God, when are you ever going to allow the boss to be the boss? I'm like, <clears throat> I'm going to need a minute with that one, <laughs> right? Because have you met me? Look how smart I am. I, I know I have a boss, but they're a, they're a dumbass, okay? And, and that's how I approach so much without God's help, right? And, and so uh, that, you know, I, I'm constantly trying to wrest satisfaction from life, from you, from my circumstance so that I feel safe 
And, and, and once I began to recognize that that's never going to happen, and I began to put it in that 6 and 7, in 11, in that God's, make that God's realm. We were talking this morning about the difference between a belief in God and a reliance. I can believe in God all day long and not trust it. All day long. It can be theoretical or it can be practical. Am I, and, and what I always think about is do I cooperate? I can gnash my teeth, pull my hair, bring all these defects to God, lay them at his feet, and, uh, and not act like I have. Fail to cooperate. Do the things that are hard. Go to work and act like an employee. Go to work and let my boss be the boss. Go to Home Depot and actually hear what my husband has to say about fencing around a garden. Instead of going, oh, no, no, no. I, I got to have a conversation with my sponsor just this week. Just this week. And I was bringing her my, you know, what have you failed to tell someone this week? So I'm telling her. Well, you know, I've got this, I've got this gal I've been working with. And don't you know, she's letting someone with five years sobriety have more influence in her life than me. (laughs) So there, can you believe this, the indignity? And she says, oh, darling, I see you're playing the big shot. And I'm like, okay, that's the first time I've heard that one, right? (laughs) Going to need a moment to process this, Um, right? And it's absolutely true. Can I hear, am I willing to hear my sponsor? Am I teachable? God, I hope so. 32 years sober, I need my sponsor more than ever, right? I need her to, to tell me the truth. And thank God she does. She's not afraid to do that. That's for sure. Um, we talk a lot about expectations in these rooms, and I can tell you what, I, I, I don't use the word expectations because I use demands. I demand things from you. I don't expect them. I demand them, right? And when I don't get them, oh, oh, well, it doesn't go well for you, I assure you. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, when it doesn't go well for you, it's certainly not going well for me right? Or for us. Uh, and, and, and so these demands, these expectations, whatever you want to call them, but the, the truth of the matter is there's no love in any of that. And that's what, that's where I fall short. You see, I keep thinking, I'm going to figure this thing out. I'm going to think my way through it. I'm going to, I'm going to come to an understanding because I'm real smart about how this is going to go. And what I failed to ever do is, is what can I bring to the situation? How can I love you? How, you know, I truly pray that prayer. God, I don't know if I'm doing your will today, but it's my heart's desire that I do so. And I hope that that pleases you, right? That's who I want to be today. That's who I believe God wants me to be. But I can lose sight of that in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Just, just point at the wrong fencing, right? And, 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 you know, but when I can bring back my relationship with God and try to cooperate with who I truly believe God wants me to be, of course it's love, right? Like my husband likes to say, if it ain't kind and loving, it ain't AA, right? I'm like, well, when you say kind and loving, what does that mean to you? No. Uh, you know, but, um, but when I get to that place where I truly am trying to give rather than demand, you know, trying to help rather than insist, then that's, you know, to, to, to care rather than that, that in that St. Francis where rather than make sure you're caring for me, right? Uh, that's when I get peace of mind. That's when I feel emotional stability. That's when I feel my most mature, right? And in this way, when I'm, when I'm trying to be that channel of thy peace, right? I read the St. Francis prayer for years, I'm like, that just sounds like you're an idiot. You know, that sounds like you're going to be a doormat. That sounds like you're going to, you know, somebody's going to take advantage of you. 
old ideas, old ideas, old ideas, and absolutely terrified of life absolutely terrified because if I don't have that reliance on God, I'm left with self-reliance and self-reliance always fails me and leaves me feeling terrified. When I'm feeling terrified, I am so immature. You know, it's like if I stay in that fear, I will become emotionally drunk and it won't be long while I'll be physically drunk. And I don't want to do that today. And I I love the progression that Don talked about in the sense that, you know, what worked for me at five years sober would never keep me sober today. What worked for me at 25 years sober would never keep me sober today. It's all about that progression, all about that progress, you know. But, But, yeah, 18 years sober, I was killing it, or so I thought. You know, just like say, just ask me, just ask me. And so um, it's also for me, where do I set that ball rolling? You know, we can ask ourselves that question. Where do I set that ball rolling? It's always with those unhealthy demands, right? Demands that you be a certain way. Talk about it in the third step all day long. If only you would do as I wish, the show would be great. And then I'd feel safe. And then I'd feel prestigious. And then I'd be secure. And then I, and then I, and then I. And all of that is for me trying to figure it out. And, oh, I spend an inordinate amount of time there to this day until I get caught one more time. Ah, I'm figuring it out. I'm figuring it out. I'm figuring it out. You know, um, in my home for the longest time, I would demand equality. Now, you could say my expectations were equality, right? And I'm talking about, you know, just around the house, equality. I feed the dog, you feed the cat. I wash the dishes, you do the cooking. This, this, this. Tit for tat. Quid pro quo, right? And as an alcoholic, I promise you, you will never do enough where I think it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Never, right? And so when I began to take, when I, you know, when I took that stuff to God, because it was miserable, it was painful being in my house, painful. And we've been together 25 years, but it was still really painful, you know, at 10, 15, uh, trying to get him to do something where I felt like I was an equal partner. Oh, my God. Is that, that just makes me want to go, oh, how boring. How boring is this, right? And when I finally began to understand the essence of that St. Francis prayer and go, what if everything I do in our home becomes a prayer? What if every dish I wash is a prayer? Every time I feed that dog, it's a prayer. How about I make the bed and it's a prayer? And I do these things out of love, gratitude, where I want someone else to feel loved by me rather than constantly trying to yank love from someone else to make me feel equal, to make me feel loved. All those things. Ugh. I was exhausted. I was exhausted and constantly feeling like, he's not meeting my needs. This is never going to work. What am I doing here? Oh, woe is me, right? Poor baby, right? And once I began to take that stance with God's help, always with God's help, I cannot manufacture love and kindness on my own. I can't. What I manufacture on my own is you're out to get me. This is a cruel hoax. I remember, I literally remember, y'all, we'd been together 15 years probably, and I was constantly believing that this, he was setting me up to make me a fool, to, to trick me somehow. 15 years he'd been at this. We'd been at this, Right? I was in prayer and meditation, and I'm thinking, oh, it's just such a hoax. I know, I know this, my life is a cruel hoax. <laughs> and I heard that wonderful voice that said, well, 
if this is a hoax, he's awfully committed to it. (laughs) What if I just let someone love me instead of demand it, insist it, and tell tell him that he's not doing it right? Oh, my God. What a concept. Um, I can do that with my children. You must be home for Christmas, right? <laughs> and my kids my kids are uh, late 20s, early 30s, building their own families, doing their thing, trying to create their own lives. They're wonderful. And, you know, I can still have these demands. You better be calling me by 10 a.m. on Mother's Day, right? Whatever those demands are on these children. Or I can just love them. I can just love them. And that's, you know, that's once again demonstrating, demonstrating with God's help a a certain amount of stability, maturity. And with that, I experience peace of mind. One more time, when I place myself in God's hands, things are better than I could ever imagine. And I, you know, we always say, don't worry, it'll be all right. What if it is all right, right now, right now? And, and, you know, as trite as that might sound, but I have to, I have to remind myself of that all the time. It is just fine right now. Huh. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's all I think I got to say about that. Oh, but I will, I will add this. You know, um, I do, one of my children <clears throat> is, is more of a challenge than the other three. Let's we'll say that. He's adorable. He is adorable. God love him. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes he, in my opinion, he misbehaves. He's not doing it right. He's not raising those children the way I think they should be raised. Guess what? Never asked my opinion on any of it. And and what I know today, what I believe with all my heart, with God's grace, I am able to believe it with all my heart today, is that his behavior towards me, towards the world, towards his wife, his children, whatever, says everything about him and nothing about me. When I can get to that place with God's help, right? Because I was so hung up on pride and ego that whatever my children did was a direct reflection on me, right? As if I own them, as if I possess them. And I don't. <laughs> and they're very clear about that today. But, um, <laughs> but, right? My boss's behavior is not about me. My sponsee's behavior is not about me. You ever have that sponsor in a meeting and go, no, 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 don't say I'm your sponsor. Mm-mm. You know? <laughs> um, y'all don't, uh, evidently, but I have. Uh, you know, uh, that, it, that, that someone else's behavior is everything about them and nothing about me. Can I one more time get back to that place of just love? You know, we, I remember when we came, when I came in 32 years ago, everyone talked about unconditional love. I just want unconditional love. Uh, as, if, as if there is such a thing. There is such a thing. It comes from God. I'd love to believe that I love you unconditionally. And I may try. But I guarantee you, if you point at the wrong fencing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, all of that to say, uh, uh, once I get back to that place of love, to the best of my ability, with God's help, one more time, uh, I, I get that peace of mind, and uh, and life is great. That's all I got. Thanks. Now, Danny's going to help you next. Good morning. Did y'all sleep good? Me neither. I'm grumpy. No. <laughs> I'm Danny. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. I've had the gift of sobriety since February the 18th of 81. Uh, it's a long time. And uh, does anybody, who in here has been sober 40 years or more? 40 or more. See, 
I want to talk to you later. I, it, I'll tell you what I found out. Being 40 years sober, the stuff that I struggled with when, what? Keep talking? Okay, how are you doing? It's good to see you again, James. James and I. Usually he introduces, we, t- we talk before I get up here, but that's really nice. To- <laughs> that's high. Okay. It was in my eye. Um, they, had, they had a lot of really good stuff to say. I'm not going to be as, as insightful as that. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. I've always been uh, impressed with uh, Don's ability to squeeze 10,000 words into two minutes. Uh, he is he is a guy, that, and, it's, and it makes sense. It's just not like random weird stuff. It's like, I don't know how he does that. I talk rather slow, and you don't have to worry whether I'm, am I from Texas? Yeah, I am. <laughs> And I and I love I love Marty. I've known Marty for a long time, and I love love Cecil, her husband, and and I think they're just the, the best in the world. I have uh, thought I talked to Don this morning. I said, "What the hell? What the pardon, What the heck? <laughs> what the hell do they mean by emotional sobriety?" You know, he's the who made that up? Bill did, of course. You might know that Doctor Bob had lived. We wouldn't let him do it, but. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal experience since I'm not sure what we're supposed to do or where we're supposed to be. Number one, if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, you are where you are. And we didn't all start the same. We didn't all, we, we don't all, you know, it's like some of us dug a deeper hole than others. You don't all have the same equipment. We all have alcoholism. We wind up here and we're given a process that we can somehow come to a place where we can say, ah, I give up. I don't know what to do. And you have, I did that and I had that wonderful experience and that peace of mind and I felt free. And I'm like, I'm connected. I know there's God. I know, no, there's God, no doubt. And I'm good. And, he, and he's going to run my life. And he would. The funny thing is, is that for 34 years prior to that, I had been, made, I'd been in charge and I had a lot of habits that, uh, you know, didn't seem bad to me. And, you know, I, I, I'm free. I feel good. And I put them back to work. But I, I, I do what I call, I did AA for a while, what I called like putting icing on a dog turd. You know, <laughs> I just, I learn all this stuff. And I go to workshops and I, I listen to old timers and I add that to me. And I, but at the core where I live, I'm the same guy. I've had a surrender. I'm not going to drink today. Thank God. I believe this thing will work. I believe in God. I believe we're going to turn things around. But it may take a while for me. And uh, it's disappointing. Cause, and the more I would fail, as Don and Marty both said, the harder I would try. This time I'm not going to be like that. You know, I'm not going to be angry. Oh, wrong. I, I would do it, you know, I would just be so frustrated because I want things my way. And I don't know that I mean that because I have good intentions. In the big book, it says selfishness and self-seeking. That, we think, is the root of our problems. Y'all are all familiar with that. That's one of our favorite lines. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. Is that right? I, that all, by the way, that all occurs in just that order for me. I mean, it was written out like it's like this is the way it happens. I have fear, and the moment I have fear, I write a story about it, and it's your fault. And I have some way to deal with that. I'm going to fix it. So I have self-seeking. So now I'm going to fix this stuff up, and when that doesn't work, I have self-pity because you don't play the game right. And I retreat into myself. And then I try to learn my life. I live my life trying to dance between the cracks of the conversation. What do we have to do here so everything will work out? You'll be okay. I'll be happy. I'm that guy I told Don this morning. I'm that guy that will climb a tree but to worry about getting down. And I, uh, you know, for a long time, I, you know, I just I did AA, and I'm like, I'm involved in helping people. Man, I'm all into that. I've helped people. I'm good in AA. I mean, I show up at AA, man, I start laughing right away. I'm, I'll cry with you. I'll pray with you. And I go home. And if I live alone, which I often did, 
if I live alone, I felt like the walls are starting to cave in on me. You know, it's like, okay, I got to go back to AA. I can't be that promise that you can be alone and at perfect peace is eluding me. I'm carpooling to and from the meetings with the four horsemen. You get into, you know, that's a horrible thing to do, but we do it. You're in AA while you're in AA in the, in the herd, it, you're good, but you get off alone or you get off with your spouse and, and it's harder. And, uh, and you don't want to tell people that because you, and somehow you feel like you have failed, but you're not. You got sober and now you're suddenly you. And it's like, well, this is very disappointing. I, uh, <laughs> I, th I thought it was like I was just going to be like a baby Bill Wilson, you know, and it is not happening. <laughs> And I go, I go to first one person and the other. What do I do? You know, and I don't like that answer. I'll go to this one, you know. Uh, David Aronofsky told me, seemed like a hundred years ago, he said, son, alcoholics are just like other people, only more so. <laughs> and boy, and that's the truth. We have these extreme emotions and some of us are even more extreme. And I don't know what I don't know what your path is. I don't know how you're supposed to be. I know that I have a hell of a time trying to figure out how to hang with you very long, and then I want to run away. I'm an introvert at heart. I will get up here, laugh, cut up, speak, and it drains me. I want to go to my room and hide, watch watch sports, and wait for the next time to come out and say, "Are they still there?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And my friend Charlie, Charlie, he does this. Charlie gets up, does it, it energizes him. Hell, he wants to be with you all the time after that. I'm not like that. And so, and so, why, why am I comparing myself to Charlie? You know, I, but I do. You know, it's like Charlie does this, Charlie does that, Marty does this. Don can use fifty thousand words in two minutes, and it's awesome. And I and we compare ourselves. God only made one Danny. It's the only one he's ever made. And and by the way, I didn't come really with a book. I mean, I'm just like, I'm winging it right now. I have no clue what we're doing here. I, I'm just trying to fill up another 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, and I'm thinking all the time while I'm doing this, I'm thinking, I wonder what they're thinking, wonder how I'm doing, you know. <laughs> well, they're going to think Marty and Don, the newcomers, they're really, they got it going on. And I don't have that poor old man, but uh, <laughs> hell, he's hung in there. I think you got to learn. I do believe in laughter. I absolutely believe in it. It diffuses things and it lets you be okay. It's kind of, it's kind of like you know how the old saying the Indians used to we used to do it say how, you know, basically means I don't have a rock in my hand. That's the same way laughter in AA is. We laugh at ourselves. We laugh at each other. We ask and we and we learn to start to just let people peek behind the curtain. What do you really like? And little by little, you'll make connections and you'll learn what you're really like. And it's not that pretty, you know, and it's even less pretty to you because we're perfectionists. I intended to get sober, do the steps right, and be at the head of the class. That's just what I thought it would happen. It did not. I did the steps. I redid the steps. I redid. The, I still do, do the steps, by the way. I live by those. I don't believe in I don't believe in I don't look at steps that people say, do the work. I never thought of it as work. What's work? What are you talking about, work? The only work you're doing is you're writing something down, you're being honest about stuff. It's just, you want to know what work is? Work is to live sober without any connection to people, without doing the things that will set you free. Don't get to step five and decide that was wonderful. Six and seven, the shortest steps in the big book, are the are the ones that will eternally change you. You constantly ha batting up, coming up against who you think you are and how you think it ought to be. And can you really can you really trust? Can you trust God? I was uh, some years sober so long ago I could just throw something out and you'd believe it because you weren't there. But it was a long time ago. A long time ago, and I got a sponsor. I got a sponsor, and I'm in Dallas, Texas, and I've got I've started a business with another guy who's a normal guy, 
And, you know, and we've got work going on and we have workers. We're, con we're a construction company. And uh, <clears throat> I, go, I go to AA at night, see. So I go to AA at night. I stay up late talking to you guys. I'm doing God's work, right? So I don't show up to work till about 10 o'clock in the morning because I'm tired. I'm like Marty. I'm like, oh, man, it's been a long night. Well, everybody else is starting at 7, you know. So one day my partner came up to me and he said, you know, Danny, he said, this, is the, this doesn't look good. He said, you're, the, you're one of the owners and you just, you know, you show up at 10 o'clock and get started. And I said, but I work late. He said, but these guys here, they look to you. And I thought, I, by God, I own part of this business. You can kiss my butt. And I mean, that <laughs> burnt me. I, I stormed off, and I went to my sponsor, and I told him, I said, I'm going to sell my part. I ain't putting up with that crap. You know, I'm, I'm out here doing AA and working and all that. I said, what do you think? He said, well, I think if it was me, I'd get up and try to be there at 6. <laughs> I mean, why? I don't even know what I was thinking when I asked it. Hey, hey. you know, because they're not, they're not, and by the way, he wasn't the one going to get up at six. It was going to be me. But, but he said, he said, I'd get up at six and he said, I'd, I'd have everything ready and I'd, I'd work as, I'd work out, work everybody. I thought, I'm going to go do this and I'm, and I'm going to show you that what it's going to do is going to wear me down and it isn't going to change the thing. And you're going to see that this is a bunch of crap. But I went ahead and I got up. And about two weeks into this, my partner walked up to me and he said, man, he said, this thing is clicking so good. I cannot believe what a difference you're making. He said, the guys just love working with you. I was almost disappointed. <laughs> you know? Cause, cause you, you know, you really don't want, I mean, you want things to be better, but you want it to be better on your terms. Not the, <laughs> not like that. Because if that's the case, you know, I got a same sponsor. I'm in Dallas and, you know, I'm, I'm getting out and I'm having trouble driving. I don't know if you, if you want to know what your spiritual condition is really like, go get in your car and drive. That'll pretty much tell you where you're at. Are you coming up here again? It's good. Okay. He's getting one out there. Um, so anyway. I'm finding it is I'm, it's, I get irritated rather easily on the highway. Uh, and, you know, people, my favorite place on the highway is to be in the center lane in front with nobody on either side of me so I can move this way or that. That's it. I don't, is that too much to ask in a city of, <laughs> in a city of like six million? It's really not that big of a deal. But I'm in Dallas and I'm doing this thing and I just, I mean, I, by the time I get where I'm going, I'm already just wound up. And, and I, yes, I pray in the morning and meditate, but not about, not deep like she does, but because I'm tired and I got up late and I'm going to pray a little bit and meditate some and, oh, hush. I've been speaking with him for a hundred years, it seems like, and I never can feel, I always come away feeling inadequate. You know what I mean? I want to say, dude, listen, I'm the guy with, the, with all the sobriety. You be quiet. <laughs> but anyway, so I, my, sponsor said, my sponsor said, uh, he said, I got, a, I got an idea. I thought, I figured you would. He said, I've got a little thing that, that Bob White gave me. And he said, he said, what I want you to do is just sit down in your chair. And, you, and he said, well, I call it, he said, we'll call it the doorknob test. He said, you walk up, you're heading out the door, and you grab that doorknob, and you realize that you're all geared up, and you're going out to do battle with people. He said, we don't need you. Go back in and sit down and read this until you can kind of believe it two or three times, and then get up and go to work. And it was a real simple little affirmation. I'd get up in the morning and say, God, it's your world. It's not my world. Everything's just the way it's supposed to be, or it wouldn't be that way. And my job is to go about my daily affairs doing what it is I should be doing, not doing what I shouldn't be doing, and keeping in mind that if it's almost right, it's wrong. And about all these other kids out here, I really understand they're your kids, not mine. And you didn't place me here to whip everybody into line. But it is my job to help them if they ask for help. 
He said, if you can, if you can just accept that, and I would do that three or four times, and I got to where I could go out and I could drive, and I was like, I'm just in, I'm right where I want to be. I could let somebody cut in front of me. I could kind of, as Marty was talking about, I could just be where my feet are. I, I, I began to quit looking up, down, and around. I started being present. And that just seems so remarkable because a month before, I, and I was in that phase, I was, I was in my bumper sticker sobriety phase. I had an AA, I had all these AA stickers on my car. <clears throat> like, honk if you know Bill Wilson. <laughs> Easy does it, you know? And I'm weaving in and out of traffic 90 miles an hour. You'd be amazed at how many people knew Bill Wilson. Uh, I remember calling my sponsor and told him I, I, I was driving down the road and I thought that just dawned on me, you know? I thought, man, those, I went out there and got those stickers off, tore them off. I don't want anybody to know I'm in AA. I called my sponsor about that. He said, Son, those stickers are for you. That's not for he said, you know, you don't need anybody honking. And easy does it is not something that you're actually acquainted with. Uh, uh, I am so prideful and so self-centered and so sure that I'm right. And how it is that I met up with you guys and one of you could talk to me the way that guy talked to me. And I and I looked forward to it. I looked forward to it. I go in there and sit down, and he called me a knucklehead. I mean, you don't talk to me like that. Hell, I, but he did, and I liked hearing it. And he taught me that uh, the value of listening to other people and of beginning to accept. He said, "Son, you don't know what's right for anybody." Look. You know, that's one of the things we learn. You listen, one of the things we listened to Clancy talk years ago, and he talked about, he talked about living out in an old beat up car in the parking lot and, and wanting to give everybody his opinion. You know, people said, uh, we don't really want what you have right now. You know, you live in, a, in an abandoned car. <laughs> I don't know what emotional sobriety looks like. I know that living with you and emulating you and wanting your and wanting your approval i do want your approval i'm i'm not a people pleaser for god's sake hardly anybody is we're approval seekers not a, that's that doesn't sound as nice you know I, people pleaser sounds good approval seeker sounds a little selfish and i'm i'm a lot like that but even that you have used to adva- to good advantage because you knew i was like that and what you did is you started saying well you want to know how to act I remember the little, these ladies right here, just, I love them, just looking at them, because they reminded me when I came to AA, and there was little, there was nice little ladies dressed real nice, and I'm sitting over here smoking cigarettes, and I'm talking like the ex-sailor that I am, and one of them told me, she got me, she said, honey, come over here and sit with us, and she said, you wouldn't talk like that if your mother was in here, would you? I said, no, ma'am, and she said, and she said, you need to learn to use the English language properly. And I said, yes, ma'am. And, and she began to talk to me about how we talk. And she said, we don't like the way you dress. This is AA. You dress like that when you go to the bar. I said, well, I, I wanted them to, to appreciate. I wanted them to approve of me. I dressed right. I tried to learn to talk right. I tried to learn. I wanted your approval. You have changed me. God, I believe this. If you're looking for God. If you're looking for good, you're looking for God. That's the truth. God, if, if it's not good, it's not God. If it's not God, it's not good. And if you're looking for good, you're looking for God. And if you're looking for God, you'll find him in people. I love you. Oh, that was awesome. Awesome, guys. We're so blessed to be here. Danny reminded me of something I told my sponsor. I I told him I think I'm a people pleaser, and he says, well, maybe we ought to check with the people you're pleasing. (laughs) Just before we start boasting here. But uh, we've got some time. Uh, We've got a mic set up here, and we want to invite folks to do uh, ask questions. And uh, awesome opportunity. And if you would, uh, go ahead and jump up. We can even adjust it down if we need to. Yeah. 
So, yeah, who has a question? All right, here we go. Uh, start cooking and stuff for lunch, but I do have a question. A couple of years ago, I had a really good sponsor that taught me a lot about emotional sobriety. And even though I only had maybe eight months at the time, I shouldn't say only, I should be grateful that I had that. But um, I've always heard that emotional sobriety is something meant for people later on in sobriety. And is it good for newcomers to learn about emotional sobriety or should newcomers kind of focus more about the steps and stuff? Marty knows that age. Okay, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, wow. You're welcome. <laughs> um, well, that's a great question, of course. And, uh, you know, I, I go back to liquor as but a symptom of my underlying condition. And so I, I don't know about y'all, but when I got here, I was like a feral cat. You know what I mean? That was wet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so so I, I really needed to get familiar with my grosser handicaps. And uh and and yet you know that what gets me drunk is my thinking, right? Because it's my thinking that's gonna bring me to that drink. So I mean you could talk chicken and the egg, egg and the chicken, whatever. But I think, you know, the steps the steps to me bring about emotional sobriety, so they go together. I don't think they're. I don't think there's either or, but it, it's they all come together. That's okay. And I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Lene. I'm an alcoholic, and I'm I'm from the Angleton Group, and my sobriety date seven three twenty. But I'm very grateful to be here, and thank y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, I thought we had a question. <laughs> She's just going for lunch. <laughs> we, right. we explained it too good. Well, you did. You did. We're in awe. The home room. All right. There's Tommy. Hi, I'm Tommy. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> so, you know, how do you get that emotional stability we're talking about? And I can remember I had a year in the program and uh, you know, I wasn't feeling too good about myself. I wasn't joyous, happy, and free. And so <clears throat> I looked around the couple of cities I was close to, and I found two guys that had what I wanted. But I didn't know how to get it. So I stopped going to the meetings I went to, and I went to the meetings that they went to, and I went out afterwards and got you know, coffee and ice cream and did all those things. And if they were getting together on a weekend, I showed up. They didn't invite me. I just showed up, you know, and I hung around. And what I found out was they were doing things that I hadn't even thought about. They were doing things that I had no idea because it never dawned on me to do those. And it took a couple of years, and I felt, you know how you feel when you, you, you're you getting better and you look around at the guys that you, that your idols. I want to be like them. And then you sort of feel sort of almost, you know, seven, eight years later, you almost feel like you, you, you're getting to their level. I think that, and I don't know how you get that stability other than taking action. One of the things that, the, I don't pray. My actions are my prayers because everything in my head is bullshit until I say it out loud or put it into action. And so, uh, but that doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's, uh, uh, you know, I, I read things that are outside of AA. And one of them was drop the rock and then drop the rock, the ripple effect. And and I'm not saying do it, read them or not, they helped me. And what they helped me with was they related a story that Bill Wilson said, was said, he, he went to uh, Minnesota and he was giving out a coin. And he said, if the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the steps and everything else are not the promises, what are the promises? 
and he left. He went back a year later to give another coin out, and they said, Bill, you know, what's the answer? And the answer he gave them was he listed 14 character defects, and opposite each one was the opposite. Dishonesty, honesty. Intolerant, tolerance. And he said, our, the opposite of our character defects are the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, the only question is, how do you get those? You get them by working the program and doing all those things that everybody else does, and you put that into action into your life. And the thing about those heroes that I had was one thing, and it was they had a ripple effect. People saw them and said, I want to be like Tab. What am I, look at him. Well, I want to be like him. But I'm not. So the people in the program put out something that, that, that's there that other people notice. Thanks. All right. <laughs> My name's Mark Fultz. I'm an alcoholic. Hello, family. Each, I love each and every one of you's room today, whether you want me to or not. Um, I'm going to lose because I, my question can't be that long. Um, you know. But anyhow, uh, I, emotional maturity. Uh, there was a bumper sticker on the way here yesterday that I read off car since someone mentioned that, and it said "horn broke, check for finger." Which panel member would that apply to? <laughs> Horn broke, check. What? What does he mean? You get shot in Houston doing that. <laughs> Self-preservation in Houston, that will stop you from acting that way. I don't know. I'm, you know, look, for us, I mean, I, that was, I, I get it what you're saying. For us, it's uh, it's pretty, by the way, this is uh, 70% alcohol. All right. <laughs> I mean, we're uh, we get we get so we got we got nothing, you know. We got me, and I'm I'm going to AA, and I got a job, and now all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I'm gripping the wheel, wheel tightly, and I'm I'm giving instructions to people, handle with care, you know. It's like the, like you said, the horn thing. Do if the horn's broke, then I shoot you a finger. What do you do? What are you doing when you do that? If you do, if you have that sticker up there, what are you actually saying to to the universe, to people? I'm special. You have to act right around me. And that's not true. You want to, you got sober. What did we want? Bill also said this. Bill wanted said we want to get back into the mainstream of life. We want to get out there and be a part of. I want to go to the grocery store and be just like everybody else, you know. Uh, and and I, I don't want to be that guy that gets 27 items and goes to the 10 lane. <laughs> and you don't want to be the guy behind that guy that's counting that, you know. I, you, so what you do in AA is when you first get to AA, you're the guy with 27 and you're in line and you shouldn't be there. And after you're here and you get very spiritual, you're the guy behind him with nine counting his. <laughs> Once you finally get to that point where you understand that you're just another bozo on the bus and that life is good for you and tough for you and same for them, you're that guy that's in the third in line and he's just like, well, sure is good. I'm here to get some food. That's what we need. That's what we want to do. We want. We don't want to be noticed anymore. We, you know, I I got sober and I just thought ever, you know, the whole world should take notice. They didn't. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bobby, a member of the Plantation Group, sober uh, since 2010. Um, I I just want to say. This meeting, you know how you go to a meeting and it really just sinks in and just you get a lot out of it. Um, that's how I feel with this. And I really, this meeting, like y'all said, I really appreciate it. Because with me, 
I've just always felt crazy. I mean, just crazy. But after listening to y'all, I know I'm not the only one. But, but you know, you just have to go through these... I feel like I've just had to go through these phases to, um, to get to listen to y'all, to get to be here with y'all, because um, it kind of gives me, it gives me some perspective, and it lets me... It lets me um, forgive myself a little bit and go a little bit lighter. And hopefully I can leave here and not be so damn hard on myself and so guilty and that I, that I can just smile and do what y'all suggested. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any questions? Who has a question? All right. I'm Randy. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Randy. Um, I don't know who this applies to. But in regards to what y'all were discussing, several years ago, my sponsor, when I met him, I had 20 years. My sobriety date's 10 one ninety one, so I just crossed that 30-year threshold. But, you know, he gave me an old four-step that come out of Hazelden. It was the guide to the four-step inventory. And man, it, it had the commandments in it. It talked about the uh, the little virtues, the building blocks, all these things. And I read that damn thing, and I got scared to hell. Because like a lot of people, you know, you come in, you're crazy, you stay sober, you know, you get five years, 10 years, 15 years, and you think you're doing pretty good. And then somebody drops that rock on you, it's like, oh, back to dinosaur days again. I ain't crossed, I ain't accomplished anything. Is, and I think what Don was talking about, is that kind of like it is? It's, it's like all of a sudden there's just a whole new, oh, shit. <laughs> Where did all this stuff come from? You know, I, I'm I'm paying the bills. I'm saving a little money here. I'm going to meetings, working with people. I got a sponsor. You know, ain't that what it is? You know, but then all of a sudden, you know, and I got a sponsor that's pretty much drilled it into me that sobriety comes in five year increments. <laughs> I mean, literally. And you know what? I've looked back, and, and I there's there is something to that. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at it now, and I'm thinking. Well, what else? You know, what do you do? How do you deal with that? That's that's my question. How do you how do you deal with that? That sounds like a a Don question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's going to require a lot of words. <laughs> that's probably the best. Mm. I'll be brief. <laughs> Not because I want to be, but because I've been shamed into it. <laughs> I have not gotten better because I quit drinking whiskey. I got better because I came and joined you. I started getting better the night I joined AA. Now, I didn't know it. But without my permission, I listened. Without my permission, I watched and in a organic fashion, I fell in love with you people. And when you love somebody, you admire them. When you admire them, you want their approval. When you want someone's approval, the fastest way to do it is you emulate them. Monkey see, monkey do. I watched how the old timers handled adversity. I watched them say, when their transmission blew up, their wife left, somebody died, reversal of fortune, you name it. They'd say, oh, well, and they meant it. And I didn't know how they did it. It was a level of comfort and acceptance that was alien to me. So this idea that there's something missing, and if I can find it, I'll be okay. 
if I stop doing what I'm doing that's making me unhappy, if I can figure out what that is, then I'll never be unhappy. And that's the most important thing in the universe to a self-centered person is to be happy. It's not AA. I discovered by watching the old timers why they were okay no matter what. Whatever the facts of their life were that day, they were okay. Their emotional pendulum, if you will, didn't swing very far. Well, that's because they weren't overly involved with themselves. I would go to my sponsor every day with my problem du jour and tell him why the world was ending or someone had to die. It was one or the other. And he'd say, Don, your problem is that you think too much about yourself. He goes, if I thought about myself as much as you think about yourself, I'd go in the backyard and hang myself. And then he'd walk away because he was spiritual like that. And uh, (laughs) is there something more? Yes. I will not discover the more alone. I know what I know today. I believe what I believe today. The essentials of recovery don't change. Willingness, open-mindedness don't change as prerequisites to, to change. And here's the number one ingredient in change. There's a lot of things that go into change. Number one, I have to be wrong about something I thought I was right about previously. Can't get there without it. And it's sometimes painful and awkward, and embarrassing, and defeating, and our ego doesn't like it, okay? But the only way to get there is you. So I stay close to you. I listen, and I watch the same things I did when I was new. And I ask questions, and I try to stay more, it's more important today than it's ever been, that I stay open-minded and willing because I know stuff, I think. One of the problems with being here a long time is you, you, you know stuff. And it's, it's useful, but it's only useful to others. And I have to remember that. It's really not useful to me. What it is to me, it's a block to new information. It'll block me off from your experience, and I will become unique again. Where I have to go and how to get there will come from you. I believe God works through you. That's what I believe. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.